Hello everyone. Welcome today. My name is Rahul Mandlik. I am leading medical affairs at Shalina Healthcare. Uh, so very excited uh, to be discussing with you today about this very important topic, uh, which is ABC of chest X-ray. This topic is uh, deeply rooted back uh, into late 19th century, year 1895 to be precise, when a German physicist uh, Wilhelm uh, Rongen's discovery uh, has led to had led to the world's first human X-ray, which is of his wife's hand, which we can see in this image. And since then, X-ray uh, has 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 been playing very great role in medical diagnosis. And we all know that how X-rays are important uh, in respiratory medicine, and that is going to be discussed today by our expert speakers. So before to that, very briefly about us, Shalina Healthcare is uh, today is one of the largest pharmaceutical uh, organizations in Sub-Saharan Africa. And from last 40 years, we have been serving African population, African patients by providing quality and affordable medicines. We ensure to maintain the uh, quality of our medicines by manufacturing them in WHO approved facilities. And we are working with uh, many medical and pharmacy institutions and uh, healthcare professionals to deliver the best patient care. So Shalina Academy is one of such academic initiative for our healthcare professionals. And today's program is brought to you under this banner. So with this, let me introduce our uh, today's speakers. Dr. Amita Nene, ma'am is head of Department of Respiratory Medicines at Bombay Hospital, Mumbai, India. She is a program in charge and teacher of DNB Respiratory Medicine. And ma'am is an examiner of MD and DNB courses for pulmonology. She is the treasurer of Indian Association of Bronchology and uh, a governing body member of Indian Chest Society. Madam is Wedge Zone Chairperson of Thoracic Endoscopic Society of India, and she is a recipient of Eng Achiever Award in the field of pulmonology. Ma'am has published more than 50 articles, as well as 12 chapters in reputed national and international journals, as well as books. Welcome to you, ma'am. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Happy to be here. Thanks. Our next speaker is Dr. Sodipo. Sir is head of Department of Family Medicines at Lagos State University Teaching Hospital, that is Lasut in Nigeria. And he is a site coordinator at Lasut for Influenza Surveillance Program by Nigerian Center for Disease Control. Sir is a chairman of Nigerian Medical Association's National Committee on Quiz and Essay. And Dr. Sodipo works with survivors of sexual assault and he liked to train healthcare professionals. Dr. Sodipo has published many papers in national and international journals and presented, presented numerous abstracts as well as papers at uh, many international as well as national conferences. Welcome to you, Dr. Sodipo. So uh, our today's program is quite packed uh, and a little bit about the format of the program. So uh, Dr. Sodipo will start with uh, with introductory part of the topic uh, and then uh, he will hand it over to ma'am who will be presenting uh, the X-ray session by using uh, many pictorial uh, slides and then there will be an interaction between both the speakers followed by live Q&A session. So please feel free to post all your questions uh, in the in the box chat box provided on the right side of the video box. As well as I would like to inform you all that uh, today's program, uh, it, it has quiz linked to this program, right? So you should be able to see the quiz maybe up to 30 minutes from the program begins. And by taking the quiz, you can earn a certificate of participation signed by our speakers. So great. That's all about the housekeeping. Now, to start with, we have Dr. Sodipo. I would like to hand over to you, sir. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Rahul, for the kind introduction. Um, thank you to Shalina for this opportunity to 
speak to colleagues from all over Africa, India, and also all over the world, because this link has been shared um, to doctors um, far and wide. Um, I also want to um, greet my um, co-presenter, Dr. Amita Nene. Um, I'm also hoping to gain some insight from your presentation as we shall go on today. So good afternoon to us all. As I was introduced, um, quite, um, <laughs> I would say quite well by Dr. Rahul. I remain Dr. Shuriko, and I thank him very much for the kind um, introduction. So I'll just be giving a little overview on um, respiratory tract infections and why it's important that we discuss this topic this um, today. I mean, depending on where we are, it's either the morning, afternoon, or evening. So we know that lower respiratory tract infections are a common source of presentation at the general outpatient clinics and in primary care. They form a common condition associated with considerable morbidity and mortality. I mean, just two years ago, we were all dealing with COVID, uh, which is part of you know, um, a type of respiratory tract infection though caused by a viral um, cause. The mortality worldwide and in Africa are highest at um, the extremes of life. So when we talk about children and the older persons, we have a lot of mortality um, from lower respiratory tract infections. But we must also be aware that there's significant morbidity among um, the young and middle-aged groups. Um, even though the mortality may not be as high as the extremes of age, there's considerable mobility, um, affectation in quality of life, and of course, the economic cost when people have respiratory tract infections. The etiology could be due to bacterial, viral, mycobacterial, and rarely fungal or parasitic agents. And we know that we tend to see the fungal and parasitic agents and even the mycobacterial agents when we are dealing with the immunocompromised um, population. There's been a lot of debate about um, the role of a chest radiograph or chest x-ray um, when we suspect that a patient has pneumonia. And a number of international guidelines actually recommend that a chest radiograph should be done when pneumonia is suspected. There are also um, various guidelines on what the specific indications for the use of a chest x-ray in the management of the lower respiratory tract infection comes into play. And I'm hoping that with our interaction with um, Dr. Mita, we'll be able to get some insight into some of the indications and, you know, where and, and some of our findings when we have this chest X-ray done. There's also a debate on the use of chest X-ray in differentiating the various etiology of respiratory tract infections. So, for example, what are the kind of findings we'd see if we're dealing with a bacterial etiology, like your streptococcus pneumonia, um, are there different findings where we are dealing with um, a bacterial, I mean, a viral cause? Are there different findings where we are dealing with a fungal cause and, of course, parasitic? Or some of that will also be discussed during the course of this presentation. And, of course, we know that outcome of the management of lower respiratory tract infection is improved by early recognition and rapid institution of empirical antibiotic therapy, especially when you are dealing with bacterial infections or even viral infections that have superimposition of um, bacterial infections on the um, initial viral force. In many cases, when chest x-rays are done, we know that some of the challenges we're having all over Africa and even worldwide, but I think it's most peculiar in Africa, is that we have insufficient number of radiologists to promptly report them. So we're having a high burden on primary care physicians and other physicians to actually be able to recognize important findings on the x-ray without necessarily waiting for a, radi I mean, for a radiologist report to be able to make clinical interpretation of, of the x-rays that have been done. And this means that we as primary care physicians and other physicians must be able to recognize features that indicate respiratory tract infections. And it's also important that we now subsequently determine the best clinical practice in using antibiotics to treat lower respiratory infections, whether in the outpatient setting, which is most commonly um, where primary care physicians work. But we know that a lot of primary care physicians are also in secondary and tertiary care at various levels. So we could also have some level of patient care. So with this, I hope I've set the tone for us to have an interesting discussion initially with Dr. Amita Nene, who will be giving us some um, radiographical um, representation of chest x-rays 
and what we as physicians need to know when we look at these x-rays. So I'm wishing us a, um, a very interesting time. Let's please pay attention and be ready to ask questions at the end of the presentations. Thank you. And once again, thank you, Shalina, for this experience and um, for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sadipo. That was a wonderful introduction to our program. I'm so looking forward to today's interaction. Thank you so much, uh, Sharina uh, Academy, for inviting me to be talking to each of you all, my wonderful colleagues and friends. And I'm so very happy that the Doc Board has provided the platform for this. So I'm going to be talking about uh, chest X-ray interpretation. So there are certain general principles while interpreting a chest X-ray, even if we are just looking at it with a patient next to us, before we want to make a diagnosis, we must have a systematic approach. What is really important is that a chest X-ray has to be interpreted in conjunction with clinical presentations and findings of the patient and never in isolation. And always compare the previous chest X-ray. You know, the current chest X-ray must be compared to the previous chest X-ray available because it gives us a lot of information. Because sometimes a chest X-ray might look alarmingly dangerous, but if the patient has an earlier X-ray two years back, if it looked exactly the same, then we know we are dealing with something which is old and not really worrisome. So always ask for a previous chest X-ray, even if the patient has not got it along. So while we start interpreting the chest X-ray, please look at the patient identification details. We want to know the age of the patient because based on the age of the patient, we come to know that certain diagnoses are more important and more common in younger children like in younger patients like a foreign body whereas malignancy etc is more common in elderly patients so patient identification details the name the age the sex is important to make a note of and this will also help us know that by mistake a wrong patient's x-ray has not been given to us we also need to know whether it's a pa view ap view lateral view etc so basically, the most common view of the chest X-ray that we prefer is a PA view. This is how it looks, as you know. What is really important is that the scapulae have to be kept outside in the of the lung fields. And therefore, in this, you can always see the chest X-ray very, very properly. So this is what the PA view looks like. And the patient's, uh, the chest X-ray film is kept in front of the patient's anterior chest wall. Shoulders are rotated forward, so the scapula is outside the lung fields, and you can see all the opacities correctly. The second view is the AP view. So AP view is done only when the patient is debilitated and can't stand, or if the patient is immobilized, like the patient is in the ICU, or cannot cooperate with the PA procedure. And over here, the film is placed behind the patient's back, and what happens is that because the heart is away from the film, as a result of that, the heart looks larger than it is. And if it's an AP view, we don't want to diagnose cardiomegaly because the heart otherwise also looks kind of big. And the trick is that because the patient would be so fine, the gastric bubble will not be seen in an AP view. So this tells us, you know, and the only problem is that usually the scapulae are a part of the chest X-ray in AP view. And therefore, a lot of opacities, which is underneath the scapulae, might be missed in AP view. The third type of X-ray is lateral view. Over here, uh, this view was being done very frequently earlier when the CT scans were not being done commonly. But with the common use of CT scan, lateral view is not done that frequently now. But basically, lateral view will tell us which part of the lung the opacity belongs to, whether it is in the upper lobe, middle lobe, or the lower lobe, which PA view alone cannot tell us. And in addition, it also tells us little more about what is behind the heart, what is below the diaphragm, etc. So very often we don't know what a lateral view, how it has to be interpreted. So basically just to tell you all, what overlies the heart is the middle lobe. What is ahead of that over here is the upper lobe. And what goes behind is the lower lobe. So this is what a lateral view looks like. And if it's a left side, then we know on the left side there's no middle lobe. And this would become the lingula on the left side. So this is what lateral view looks like. 
Then we have the lateral decubitus position. So over here, the patient has to lie down either right laterally or left laterally. And this was very, very common before ultrasound was done commonly for pleural effusion. So if the patient was suspected to be having pleural effusion, the patient had to, die or had to lie down in lateral decubitus position with the site of the pleural effusion lying down. And as you can see over here, the fluid will migrate downwards and it will look or opaque and therefore you know that this is the pleural effusion which is present. If at all the patient is in the ICU and we are suspecting pneumothorax and over here for ultrasound is not possible, then you can do lateral decubitus position for this pneumothorax patient also. But over here, the abnormal side will be up, unlike pleural effusion where the abnormal side is down. We have lordotic view, which is a special view. This is done when we are suspecting something in the apical, in the upper lobe, in the apical region, because the chest x-ray PA view does not show the apex of the lung very well, because we have the clavicle, we have the ribs, we have the soft tissue, and therefore if we do a PA view and we think that there's a suspicious opacity in the apex of the lung, then please ask for a lordotic view. As you can see, in a lordotic view, the ribs become more straight, and therefore the clavicle are moved out and the soft tissue is out and if there's a small opacity it can be picked up on lordotic view which should be messed up in a normal PA view. So the thing is that these are the normal kind of views that we have for chest x-ray. Now after we are looking at a chest x-ray which is commonly PA view there are three main factors we want to look at before we start interpreting our x-ray. So the first point is inspiration. What is the level of inspiration? So it is very, very important that the chest x-ray is done in full inspiration so that the lungs are really large and every small opacity can be seen. So how do we know that this x-ray is done in full inspiration? So we either count the posterior ends of the ribs or we count the anterior ends of the ribs. So basically, if the patient has done a chest x-ray and in full inspiration and if we are counting the PA view, uh, the posterior end of the ribs, then please note that the 10th rib posteriorly should be touching the highest part of the diaphragm. As against that, if we are counting anterior ends of the ribs, like we are counting over here, the 6th anterior end of the rib, if it touches the highest post or point of the diaphragm, then this chest x-ray is done in full inspiration. This is very, very important. The second is we talk about exposure. Is the chest x-ray well exposed or not? So how do you know how do we know that our x-ray is well exposed? So we are supposed to look at the intervertebral discs in the lower part of the heart. So the lower thoracic intervertebral disc should be just visible over here. This is a vertebra, this is an intervertebral disc, vertebra, intervertebral disc. So lower thoracic intervertebral dash should be just visible through the heart. This is known as a well exposed x-ray as you can see over here. So sometimes you can't see the ribs, the intervertebral discs at all. So this is known as underexposed x-ray. As you can see over here, the intervertebral discs are not seen. So this is known as underexposed x-ray. And the problem of the underexposed x-ray is that the lung will look much whiter and therefore you might feel that there are certain infiltrates, certain abnormalities are falsely present, which are actually not present. And therefore you will overdiagnose abnormalities which are actually not there. As against that, if you can see intervertebral disc too well, you can just see them very, very well over here. So if the intervertebral discs can be seen very well, then this is an overexposed x-ray. And the problem of the overexposed x-ray is that the lung looks very, very black. So two problems. There could be an opacity. You may miss this opacity because the lung is looking very, very black. And the second thing is that you may falsely diagnose the patient to be having emphysema because the lung is looking so black and the vascular markings are not seen well. So it's very important to know what is the exposure of the patient x-ray because it is important. So now let's look at this x-ray. So this patient underwent a health checkup and this x-ray was sent to me for interpretation. So as you can see over here, this is a very overexposed x-ray and we can see intervertebral discs very, very well. The lungs are looking very, very black. So I was a little worried that I should not be missing any abnormality and therefore I asked the patient to repeat a chest x-ray which was well exposed. So this is a properly exposed x-ray of the same patient. 
please look at the x-ray is it looking abnormal so the thing is overexposed x-ray almost looks normal but now that we look at the properly exposed x-ray we are actually seeing a rounded opacity a solitary pulmonary nodule in the same patient whose x-ray is well exposed this time and this opacity is hardly actually seen over here so can you believe it this we did a cd guided biopsy and this turned out to be adenocarcinoma so had we not insisted for a properly exposed x-ray then we would have missed an early malignancy for the patient which at this stage was operable because the PET CT showed no other involvement and the sur surgery was done, the SPN was resected and the patient is doing well. This is another example. So this is an overexposed x-ray, again a health checkup patient with no symptoms came to me and the x-ray looks fine. Please look at this x-ray. And the patient was advised to do a proper x-ray again, which was well exposed. And this is what the x-ray looks like. Can you please see the opacity over here? The rounded opacity over here, which is not really seen over here in the same patient, this turned out to be squamous cell CA. So what I want to tell you all is that if the x-ray is not well exposed, please make the patient repeat the x-ray because we don't want to miss an opacity because missing this could actually cost somebody his life. The third part is centralization. So it is very, very important to see if the x-ray is well centralized or not. So basically, the thing is that this is a spinous processes of the vertebrae, and these are the medial ends of the clavicle. So the distance between the spinous process and the medial ends of the clavicle should be equidistant. If this is equidistant, then this x-ray is well centralized. Now look at this x-ray over here. The spinous processes are over here. The medial end of the clavicle is here and the other medial end of the left clavicle is here. So you can clearly see that this x-ray is not well centralized and this is a rotated x-ray. So what is the problem with the rotated x-ray? Over here what happens is that this hilum is very very prominent and this hilum is not prominent at all. And when we look at this x-ray we may falsely diagnose prominent hilum or hilar adenopathy and we may falsely ask the patient to get a CT scan done. So it's very very important to see what is the centralization and if it is a rotated x-ray then please decide if the hilar lymph node is really prominent or not and if required repeat a chest x-ray which is well centralized. So now that we know what views are there, now that we know the important three points, the inspiration the exposure and the centralization. Let's see what are the different radiological lung zones. So we know this is the anterior end of the first rib and this is the anterior end of the second rib. So part of the lung which is above the anterior end of the second rib is the upper zone. So this is the upper zone, the right upper zone and the left upper zone. What is between the anterior end of the second rib and the anterior end of the fourth rib? This is the middle zone, right middle zone and the left middle zone. And what is below the anterior end of the fourth rib, everything below that becomes the lower zone, the right lower zone and the left lower zone. So please understand that when we want to describe a chest x-ray, we first talk about lung zones during description. And when we are giving the diagnosis, we talk about the lobe if we can actually make out. And this is important because chest x-ray is unidimensional it's single dimensional and therefore the middle lobe might be present in the same place as the lower lobe and therefore we describe the opacities in the way of describing it in the lung zones now now that we know how to describe a chest x-ray let's see when we are looking at a chest x-ray what do we do so we have to be very very systematic first we look at the lungs after that we look at the pleural surfaces after that, we look at the cardio mediastinal contours to see if everything is fine. After that, we look at the bones. The bones that we see are the ribs and the clavicles and the scapulae. After that, we look at the soft tissue, like we can see the breast shadows over here, so that we know it's a woman's x-ray. And then we look at the abdomen. We cannot miss out on looking at the abdomen, which is seen in the chest x-ray. So if we look at the chest x-ray with, uh, with this sequence, then we will never miss out anything. It is very, very important that there are certain areas which are worth for a second look. 
these are known as blind areas in the chest x-ray and if we don't look at them again then we are likely to miss out opacities so these areas the blind areas of the lung chest x-ray are the apices of the lung x-ray the retrocardiac areas the left and the right parts of the lungs which are behind the heart the hyalur regions and part of the chest x-ray below the diaphragm. So you have to look at these areas once again before calling the x-ray as a normal x-ray. So let's look at this x-ray. So over here, we are looking at the x-ray. The lungs are looking fine. The pleural surfaces is looking fine. The medial sternal angles are looking fine. The ribs are looking fine. The clavicle is looking fine. Soft tissue, we can't see any of the uh, what is below the diaphragm is looking fine. So is everything okay? So now we look at the blind areas, the apices, the retrocardiac areas, etc. Let's look at the apices again. Okay, are we seeing something over here? Yes, there is something in the apice, uh, apex of the lung which we would have normally missed out. So basically the patient had actually a lesion in the left lung apex and this is what it looked like and it turned out to be actually a TB granuloma. Now let's look at this chest x-ray. This x-ray is looking fine, but there are certain blind areas. The apex is looking fine. The second area is retrocardiac area. Over here, we can see something rounded over here. Can you all see it? Yes. So basically, there is a left retrocardiac opacity and a lateral view actually showed a huge mass over here. We need to know that the left lower lobe is behind the heart. It's retrocardiac and therefore PA view does not properly show the left lower lobe and therefore we have to see what is behind the heart and over here this patient actually had a left lower lobe mass and had we not seen the retrocardiac area properly we would have actually missed out on a huge mass in this x-ray. Okay, let's look at this x-ray. Everything looks fine. Let's look at the dark, the blind areas. Let's look at below the diaphragm. Can we see something below the diaphragm? Yes, this patient is air under the diaphragm. So this patient had actually come with a perforation in the abdomen. So what I want to say is that the blind areas of the lungs have to be looked at. Okay, so after we do all this, now we start the actual interpretation. So while interpreting the x-ray, if we know certain patterns of the lungs, then we'll be always correct. So the thing is that whenever we see the x-ray, let's try to describe the x-ray. Let's try to describe the pattern as homogeneous, patchy, irregular, round, etc. Then we'll know what we are dealing with. So the thing is, whenever you see something, try to call it one of these seven patterns, which I'll come to. So if we see an opacity and if it's more than one centimeter in size, it becomes an alveolar opacity. That means this opacity is filling up the alveoli of the lungs. These opacities which are more than one centimeter may be diffuse like you are seeing diffusely in both the lungs or it could be isolated to a few segments of the lungs or it may be involving the entire lobe of a lung. Because these opacities are more than one centimeter, all these opacities will be described as alveolar opacity. So basically, whenever you see an opacity of more than one centimeter, that means something is filling up the lung alveoli. And please note that only five things can fill up the lung alveoli. It could be either infection, like pneumonia if the history is acute, or it could be TB if the history is kind of subacute or long-standing. The second thing to fill up the alveoli is fluid. So it could be either pulmonary edema if the patient has some cardiac history or if the patient is a kidney patient or the patient has cirrhosis of liver or the patient could be having ARDS. So over here, the fluid is going to fill up the alveoli. The third thing to fill up the alveoli is cells. So if the patient has malignancy, then the cancer cells will fill up the alveoli or the patient could be having eosinophilic lung disease, the eosinophilia in which eosinophils will fill up the alveoli. The fourth thing to fill the alveoli are inflammation. So it could be connective tissue disease, it could be organizing pneumonia, it could be drug induced if the patient is on bleomycin, if the patient is on amiodarone, then drug induced inflammation could actually fill up the alveoli. It could be occupational lung disease if the patient is working and has exposure to silica, it could be occupational lung disease, which is filling up the alveoli. So that is inflammation. And the fifth thing to fill up alveoli is blood. 
pulmonary hemorrhage. I request each of you all please take a photo of the film. Any opacity more than one centimeter differential diagnosis has to be any of these only. You know the history of the patient and you will be easily able to diagnose what we are dealing with. Let's look at examples. So over here all the opacities are more than one centimeter. They are diffuse involving both the parts of the lungs. In certain areas they are merging together. So over here we know this is alveolar opacity. So now let's look at the history of the patient. This patient is a diabetic. He's got low-grade fever for one month. He's had anorexia. He's got weight loss of 3 kgs in 6 weeks. He's got cough with expectoration. He's got streaky hemoptysis. Then we know this is most likely tuberculosis. As against this, if this patient has high-grade fever with chills, he's got purulent sputum, his WBC count is 18,000, there is right pleuritic chest pain, then we know this is most likely a bacterial pneumonia. So basically the history is really going to help us tell what we are dealing with. As against this, if this patient has CA stomach, then we know there's a high chance of this being metastasis in the lungs. So over here, the history tells us what we are dealing with and this is alveolar opacity and we know out of those five things we need to fill this in to know what we might be dealing with let's look at the other x-ray now so basically this is the second x-ray over here we are seeing more than one centimeter opacities they are parahyalar and they are involving the mid zone and the lower zones of the lung so most likely if the patient has edema feet raised jvp then this becomes pulmonary edema as against this, if this patient is HIV positive, then this could be pneumocystis pneumonia, this could be even CMV, and this would be kind of early ARDS because of that. Let's look at this X-ray. So over here, again, we are seeing a patchy opacity, which is involving the right lower zone of the lung. And if the history is acute, then this turns out to be a pneumonia. Let's look at this. Over here, we are seeing rounded opacities, which are bilateral. If this patient has a high-grade fever with chills, this becomes pneumonia. If this patient has low-grade fever, little longest history, then this could become TB. If this patient has malignancy, like say the patient has a cancer of the intestine, this becomes a metastasis to the lungs. So again, the history will tell us out of those five things, if the patient is having hemoptysis, this could become alveolar hemorrhage. So the thing is, if we know opacity is more than one centimeter and what are the things likely to fill up the alveoli, then we know what we are dealing with. So that was the first pattern, the alveolar opacity. If the opacity is less than one centimeter in size, we call it interstitial opacity, which means it is filling up the interstitium of the lung. Now, interstitial opacities are either like reticulations or they are nodules. So over here, what we are seeing are lines. These lines are known as reticulations. Or we see rounded small nodules less than a centimeter. These are known as nodules. Either of the earlier pattern, the reticulation or the nodules make interstitial opacities if they are less than one centimeter in size. Now, again, if the patient is interstitial opacity, the same five things which filled up the alveoli, the same five things will fill up the interstitium, but the differential diagnosis will be different. So if so, these again take a photo. It could be infection, like it could be viral pneumonia, atypical pneumonia, like mycoplasma chlamydia, or it could be early PCP or CMV pneumonia while it is still in the interstitium and not in the alveolar stage. It could be inflammation, like idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, sarcoidosis, hypersensory pneumonitis. It could be occupational lung disease. It could be connected tissue disease. It could be drug-induced. This is all the earlier stage when it is only filling up the interstitium. It could be fluid. It could be an interstitial stage of pulmonary edema or ARDS. It could be cells like lymphangitis carcinomatosis where the malignancy spreads through lymphovascular bundles. Or again, it could be eosinophilic lung disease and it could be blood, the pulmonary hemorrhage. So the same five things fill up the interstitium and the alveoli, but the diagnosis will change of the same five things based on the size of the opacity. So let's look at this. Over here, we are seeing nodules, which are bilateral, they are diffuse, they are less than one centimeter in size. So this patient, if he has a high-grade fever with chills, he's on a cold, he's on malaise, he's got body ache, a three-day history, this becomes like a viral pneumonia. As against this, this patient has peripheral eosinophilia. His, w, his eosinophil count is 40% in the blood. And at the same time, the top, uh, 
the absolute usable count is say 3000 then we know this could be pulmonary eosinophilia if the same patient has exposure to pigeons this could be probably hypersensitive pneumonitis so if you know less than one centimeter nodule you know which five things will fill it up you know the history whatever fits in then you know what you're dealing with let's look at this opacity again we have each opacity is less than one centimeter we are seeing nodules we are seeing reticulations they are bilateral they are mid zone lower zone this becomes interstitial stage of pulmonary edema or becomes interstitial stage of ARDS let's look at this very fine nodules top to bottom they are present everywhere most likely this could be biliary TB or it could be a viral pneumonia atypical pneumonia and if the patient is on some medicine like amiodaron then this could be drug induced disease so looking at the opacity looking at the history and what fills up we know what we are dealing with the third pattern is nodules and masses so let's look at this lesion this is a rounded lesion very very sharply defined the edges are well seen so if this is less than three centimeter in size we call it a nodule and at the same opacity well circumscribed well defined rounded but more than three centimeters in size then we call it a mass so less than three centimeter becomes a nodule. It could be a single nodule like this, or it could be multiple nodules. And if the same opacity is more than three centimeters in size, then we call it a lung mass. So whenever it's a mass, we have to see whether it's well-defined or if it's ill-defined. We see if there's any calcification or not, because if calcification is present, usually it becomes benign. And always look if there is a mass, look at the underlying rib. As you can see over here, the rib is eroded by this mass and therefore we know this is most likely malignancy. The fourth pattern is, is it a collapse, is it an atelectasis? So basically we see a homogeneous opacity and with this see, we see signs of volume loss. Either trachea might be shifted to the same side or the hilum may be pulled up or the diaphragm may be pulled up. So you see homogeneous opacity with the signs of volume loss. It becomes a collapse like over here. This is right upper lobe collapse. We are seeing homogeneous opacity. The right hilum is pulled up. The diaphragm is pulled up. So this is right upper lobe collapse. Let's look at this. Homogeneous opacity involving the entire left lung. The trachea is shifted to the left. The heart is shifted to the left. The fundic bubble is raised. Therefore, we know this is a collapse. So this is left lung collapse. The fifth pattern is bulla, cysts and cavities. So over here, we see hole, a hole inside the lung. So look at this x-ray. Over here, you can actually see a hole inside the lung. So whenever you see a hole inside the lung, we are going to look at the margins. So if the margins are less than one millimeter in size, and if all the margins are not well defined, then this becomes a bulla. So over here, this is a large bulla, which is seen as a hole inside the lung. As you can see, this is the margin, but the other margins here are not well seen. So when all the margins are not well seen, and if the margins are less than one millimeter, this becomes a bulla. Sometimes the margins are seen well, more than one millimeter. However, they are still thin. So over here, this is a cyst in the lung. It could be a single cyst like we are seeing over here or it could be multiple rounded cysts over here that we are seeing. So these are multiple bronchiectatic cysts and this is a single cyst in the patient. So again, it is a hole inside the lung. The, the, the margins are well seen and are more than one millimeter, but they are not thick walled. If we see, this is again example of a cyst where we are seeing multiple holes. The margins are well seen, but they are not thick. Over here, we are seeing a hole inside the lung. Margins are well seen, but it's more than one millimeter and it's thick walled. So this becomes a cavity. So whenever we see cavity, it could be because of necrosis. So common cause of necrosis are, of course, infection like TB. But please note, malignancy can also give rise to necrosis. And therefore, a cavity can always be a malignancy also. And therefore, we need to diagnose what we are dealing with. And we can't blindly call it an infection like TB. Let's look at this. This is a hole inside the lung. And over here, we are seeing an air fluid level. So this is cavity with an air fluid level. This can also be called a lung abscess. So basically, whenever we see cavities, if the margin is less than four millimeters, as like we are seeing over here, then more chances of the cavity being benign, 
as against this, if we see a cavity and if the margins of the cavity are more than 16 millimeters, then there are more chances of this cavity being malignant. If the margin of the cavity is between 4 to 16, then it could be either benign or malignant and you need to investigate as to what you're dealing with. The sixth pattern is lymph adenopathy. And basically, we all know we can see parahyalal lymph node over here and we can see bilateral lymph nodes hyla over here. So let's look at this X-ray, right paratrical lymphadenopathy, bilateral right and left hyla lymphadenopathy. So this combination is most commonly seen in sarcoidosis, but can also be seen in tuberculosis. It can be seen in lymphoma. It can be seen in fungal diseases and also malignancies. The last pattern is pleural diseases. So we know when if the patient has pleural effusion, there'll be blunting of the costophrenic angle and there is a concave shadow which is seen with the highest margin along the pleural surface and there might be shift of mediastinum to the opposite side because the patient has pleural effusion. Basically, when you look at the chest x-ray, you can actually make out how much the fluid the patient might be having. So if the CP angle is blunted, this patient has minimum 175 ml of fluid. If both the domes of the diaphragm can't be seen, the medial and the lateral end of the diaphragm can be seen here. If they can't be seen over here, then the patient has at least 500 ml of fluid. And we should count the anterior end of the ribs. If the fluid is reaching up to anterior end of the fourth rib, then this patient has at least one liter of fluid. Then we know plural uh, other opacity is the pneumothorax. So over here, we are seeing the collapsed lung border. And this is the air. So this is the pneumothorax. This is air fluid level. This is hydropneumothorax. Over here, you can see the CP angle is blunted. The size of the left lung is smaller. We can see an opacity going up. This patient is pleural thickening. And we are seeing a calcified opacity over here. So this patient actually has pleural calcification, which is also known as pleural plaque. This patient again has pleural calcification. This patient was working in asbestos industry. This patient has bilateral pleural plaques. So this is what pleural calcification looks like. TB is very, very important. How does TB look like? So basically, the TB will involve the upper lobes, the apical and posterior segment, or it will involve the superior segment of the lower lobes. This is how TB usually presents. In addition, the patient might have a cavity or will have airspace or alveolar opacities. In addition, the patient may have diffuse alveolar opacities or the patient might have miliary pattern or may have pleural effusion. Then we have old heel TB. Over here, we have calcific opacity, which is likely to be the gone lesion, the calcified granuloma. With the calcified granuloma, we often see calcified lymph nodes, which is known as the Ranke complex. In addition, we also see a pleural thickening in uh, patients with past history of TB. And we can see fibrosis in signs of volume loss, like we are seeing over here. There are certain diagnostic appearances very, very interesting. So over here, look at this X-ray. The X-ray is looking very, very dark. The X-ray is actually well exposed. However, the lung fields are looking very, very dark. The diaphragm is flat. You're seeing seven ribs over here and the lung markings can't be seen. The heart is small in size. It's a tubular heart. So this patient has emphysema. This is what typically an emphysema X-ray looks like. Let's look at this x-ray. Homogeneous opacity over here, but there are no signs of volume loss. We are actually seeing air bronchogram over here. That means this patient has right upper lobe pneumonia, typical appearance. This is, uh, please note over here, this patient has homogeneous opacity, but there are signs of volume loss. The hilum is pulled up and the diaphragm is pulled up. As a case, so this is right upper lobe collapse. Over here, homogeneous opacity, no signs of volume loss, air bronchogram. This is right upper lobe, pneumonia. Let's look at this. This is bilateral opacities, mid zone, lower zone, parahyalar. This is known as back swing appearance. And this means there is fluid inside the lungs, most commonly seen in pulmonary edema. This is more back swing appearance. Again, pulmonary edema, florid pulmonary edema. 
over here this patient is rounded opacity the patient was very breathless we gave the patient oxygen and we gave him less six he passed a lot of urine and the opacity disappeared so this is known as a phantom tumor this is seen as a fissural effusion and commonly seen in patients of fluid overload so this is known as phantom tumor and this is also known as intrafissural pleural uh, pulmonary edema this is bilateral opacity seen in both the lungs this is known as cannonball appearance this is typically seen in lung metastasis this is known as wedge-shaped opacity. So if the patient has this opacity, then commonly this was described for pulmonary embolism where there is pulmonary infarct. But however, this can also be seen in consolidation. This is the opposite of this. So we are seeing a triangular opacity near the heart. This is typically seen in right middle lobe collapse. Over here, we have the lung and we are seeing certain abnormal prostrations over here with this typical pattern so over here this patient has colon the bowel is come between the diaphragm and between the liver this is known as chilidity appearance there is something which is known as sell out sign which is very very important so basically what happens is that if you have opacity in this part of the lung and if it is in connection with the heart then this opacity will be obscured so over here we are seeing an opacity in the right mid zone but the heart border can't be seen. That means this opacity is in contact with the heart and we know right middle lobe is in contact with the heart and therefore this becomes a right middle lobe consolidation. As against this, we have an opacity over here but the heart border can be seen well. That means this is not in contact with the heart and therefore we know this becomes right low low opacity, right low low pneumonia. This is known as sell out sign. There is something which is known as air crescent sign in which you see a cavity and inside cavity you see a rounded opacity and this is a crescent shaped air. This is known as air crescent sign and this is typically seen in fungal ball. This is known as continuous diaphragmatic sign where in addition to diaphragm below the heart also diaphragm can be seen. This is typically seen in pneumomediastinum. Over here, we have homogeneous opacity and the fissure is actually coming down. This is known as a bulgy fissure sign. So this was once upon a time described as diagnostic of Klebsiella pneumonia, but now it has been seen with other pneumonias also. So this is known as bulgy fissure sign, diagnostic of pneumonia. Uh, over here, you can see, you feel that somebody's hand is kept over here. So this is known as glove finger sign, as you can see over here. And this is typically seen in patients of uh, patients with mucus plugging, as can be seen in asthma or patients of ABPA, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. This is the patient with water bottle heart, a huge heart, cardiomegaly. This is typically seen with pericardial effusion. Let's look at this. This patient is in the ICU. He's intubated. We know this is supine uh, X-ray, the AP view. As you can see over here, the CP angle on the left is going much, much below the CP angle on the right. This is known as deep sulcus sign and this is diagnostic of a pneumothorax on the left side. This is very, very important for all our physician and intestinal intensivist friends. This is known as a pregnant lady sign, also known as D sign. This is diagnostic of encystic pleural effusion and therefore this patient could be having empyema, hemothorax or loculated pleural effusion when you see a sign like this. Over here, we can see a homogeneous opacity on the right lung. We can't see the right lung at all, but the right main bronchus is an abrupt cutoff. You cannot follow the right main bronchus like you follow the left main bronchus. This is known as the bronchus cutoff sign. So if this means that there is something present intrabronchially in the right main bronchus, if the patient is a child, then it's likely to be a foreign body. If the patient is a smoker, then it's likely to be a malignancy. If the patient is having hemoptysis, it's likely to be a clot. And if the patient has asthma, it's likely to be a mucus plug. This is known as bronchus cutoff sign. So I've given a lot of information. Uh, I've come to uh, the end of my talk. Let me see how much y'all have been able to gather. I'm going to take a quick quiz. Uh, I can't really hear what y'all are going to answer, but let's see if y'all can really answer this. So what pattern is this? This rounded pattern hole inside the lung with thick walls so this is a cavity these opacities over here 
they are more than one centimeter they are known as alveolar opacity so this patient has a cavity with alveolar opacity the history of the patient is for six weeks low grade fever weight loss anorexia most likely diagnosis very good tuberculosis however this can also be malignancy and therefore please don't uh, confirm without confirmation don't treat the patient okay there is a big hole inside the lung over here thick wall cavity thick wall margin so this becomes a cavity the dds are infection or it could also be malignancy very good okay homogeneous rounded opacity well defined more than three centimeters in size so this is known as a lung mass very good if it was less than three centimeters we would have called it a nodule very good okay what is this we are seeing over here air fluid level so this is a hydropneumothorax on the left side excellent okay over here what is it the heart is actually on the left side so this is known as very good sorry the heart is on the right side so this is known as a dextrocardia excellent what is this triangular opacity and the heart border can't be seen this is typical appearance seen in very good right middle lobe collapse excellent okay again a homogeneous we are seeing a hole inside the lung so this becomes thick wall cavity and we are seeing an air fluid level so cavity with an air fluid level is also known as an abscess excellent okay over here i see you patient here the left sided cp angle is very very deep so this is known as a deep sulcus sign and this is diagnostic of left pneumothorax excellent okay the heart is very very enlarged water bottle sign what is this diagnose diagnostic of pericardial effusion excellent okay over here what is this x-ray showing we are seeing a cavity over here and inside a cavity there's a rounded opacity and we can see crescent shaped air around so this is known as a crescent sign excellent which is seen in fungal ball excellent okay over here the right and the left hyla are very very prominent and right paratracheal lymph node is also seen so this is right paratracheal and right hyla and left hyla lymph adenopathy most commonly seen in sarcoidosis also seen in tb lymphoma and malignancy okay what is this homogeneous opacity filling up entire left lung but shift of mediastinum on the opposite side trachea is also shifted on the opposite side so this is massive left pleural effusion and the left lung is showing multiple opacities it could be tb or it could also be malignancy excellent okay we are seeing bilateral rounded opacities what is this appearance known as very good cannonball shadows diagnostic of metastasis excellent okay over here we are seeing multiple holes in the lung they are well defined the borders are seen well more than one centimeter but not thick walled so these are multiple lung cysts very good what is this a hole inside the lung but thin hair like margins all the margins are not seen and the margin is less than one millimeter so this becomes a bulla excellent what is this over here the heart is on the right side but the stomach bulla the pundic bubble is also on the right side so is this dextrocardia or this is something else very good this is dextrocardia with situs inversus excellent homogeneous opacity left lung we can't see anything trachea is on the left side the heart is moved to the left the fundic bubble is gone up that means this is left lung collapse excellent okay over your homogeneous patchy we are seeing a patchy opacity in the right mid zone and the right heart border is seen well so this is a consolidation not in the right middle lobe but the right lower lobe excellent what is this appearance known as bat swing appearance excellent seen in pulmonary edema excellent what are we seeing over here anything abnormal we are seeing the collapsed lung border we are seeing air over here and there are no lung markings here that means this patient has right sided pneumothorax excellent and we can also see a tube which is put inside for draining it excellent over here we can see this diaphragm we can see this diaphragm and below the heart also the diaphragm can be seen so this is continuous diaphragmatic sign and this is diagnostic of pneumomediastinum excellent fine right lung can't be seen right main bronchus abrupt cut off this is known as 
bronchus cutoff sign and this tells you there's something inside the bronchus and this patient should be undergoing a bronchoscopy. Excellent. Okay. What are we seeing over here? We are seeing a hole inside the lung. The borders of the lungs are well seen. They are more than one millimeter, but not thick walled. So this becomes a lung cyst, a left lower lobe lung cyst. This is a child. He had left lower lobe pneumonia and he's developed a left lower lobe pneumatocel, most commonly seen with staphylococcal pneumonia. Excellent. What is this appearance? We have intestines on the right side below the diaphragm. This is known as chilladity syndrome. And these people usually present with breathlessness and a lot of acidity and gas. What is this? Lot of nodules, less than one centimeter. Lot of reticulations. This is known as interstitial pattern. This could be interstitial lung disease. It could be viral pneumonia, atypical pneumonia, whatever fits into the history. What is this? This is a pregnant lady's sign, also known as D sign. And this is known, seen in loculated pleural effusions, which can also be empyma or hemothorax. What is this rounded opacity? This is a phantom tumor or this is intrafissural pulmonary edema. Excellent. The treatment is diuretics and this will just disappear. Okay, what is this? We can see a hand over here in the right upper lobe. This is hand in glove, which is seen because of mucus plugging and this is seen in asthma and ABPA. Excellent. What is this? Bilateral hyalur and right paratrical lymphadenopathy. Awesome. What is this? We are seeing pleural calcification. We know it is not lung calcification because lung calcification will be restricted to a particular lower margin, whereas pleura will be all over because pleura does not follow the lung margins. Okay, what is this? Are the lungs looking fine? Do we look at the blind areas of the lung? Apex, nothing. Behind the heart, nothing. Below the diaphragm, yes, we are seeing air under diaphragm. So this patient has come with an abdominal visceral perforation. Excellent. So I've given a lot of information to summarize. Remember, technical quality is very, very important. So please look at the level of inspiration, look at exposure, look at centralization. Please develop a systematic approach. Please ask for a previous chest x-ray. Look at the lungs first, then look at the pleural surfaces, then look at the cardiomedia standard structures, then you look at the hyla, you look at the bones, you look at the soft tissue, and then you also look at the abdomen, what is being seen. It is important to characterize and describe the lesions. In this way, you will not miss anything and you will also know your differential diagnosis. And what is important is whether typical or atypical, please always keep TB at the back of your mind because TB can be the great mimic and it can surprise us with every possible diagnosis. So at the end of my talk, I hope that from darkness to light, we got our chest x-rays right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Amita. Thank you, thank you. That was quite a wonderful um, presentation. I think I have about three pages of notes that I've uh, taken down, you know, for very, very important um, indications, very, very important findings that we'll see on the x-ray. Um, we're going to have a question and answer session now. But before that, I think the first question that I'm sure a lot of people on this call would want to ask is, are we going to get some of your slides? Are we going to get your slides shared so that um, I'm sure some people want to study this after this presentation? I hope we're going to get it. Um, yeah, through Shalina. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah, I'm most happy to share my uh, slides. I, I mean, if it's going to help anybody, I mean, I definitely will send it across. Everybody can have my presentation. Okay, that's wonderful. So thank you so much for that. So we're just going to have a few questions um, to try to drive home some of the points you've made. Um, so I guess my first question is going to be, um, can you just reemphasize um, the important landmarks that we have to look at when assessing a chest x-ray? Can you just emphasize that for us again? Thank you. Yeah. So the thing is, it's very, very important to know what the lung zones we are talking about because we need to describe the findings as per lung zones so that if you are sitting somewhere away and you don't have my x-ray, if I tell you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So we want to talk about the right and the left and we want to talk about the lung zones. So whatever see is seen above the anterior end of the sex of anterior end of first and the second rib. Whatever is above means the upper zone. What is between the anterior end of the second and the fourth rib will make the mid zone. 
and what is below the fourth anterior end it makes the lower zone so if i say that there is a rounded opacity less than 3 cm in the right upper zone if you also not present with me looking at the x ray you can visualize where the opacity is so this is a important lung uh, uh, anatomy that we want to really refer to okay so thank you so much um another an, another question i know you emphasized um some of the most times we do a posterior anterior view uh, for our x rays so you emphasize that for the lateral um view it helps us um to be able to assess um for example pleural effusions that we may have missed um so can you just tell us and probably i i know you mentioned um us doing an ap view once in a while but that's probably for children so can you just emphasize the other views that you mentioned in terms of yes. though not commonly done but just to help us you know to emphasize that yes uh, so p view as i said is most important because the thing is p view is like if a patient is standing next to you how you look at his lungs you exactly see in a p view and the best thing about p view is that a scapula out of the lung border so nothing is going to obscure your lung view so as far as possible we must always have p view however it's not the luxury always it could be an infant who can't even stand so we have to do a sleeping x ray over here we need to do an ap view if at all the patient is debilitated is very very anorexic very very cachectic is some terminal patient can't even stand in that case we can't do a pa view in that case we'll do an ap view also sometimes a patient could be in the icu on a ventilator in this case we'll do an ap view sometimes patient could be having a bad a hip fracture or a leg fracture because of which cannot stand up in that case you can actually do a sitting ap view so the thing is ap view is done in children it's done in debilitated people who cannot stand up it is done in icu patients and it's done in patients who can sit but cannot stand and in ap view the x ray film is kept behind on the back and therefore the heart is little away from the film and therefore there will be always an apparent cardiomegaly that is a problem and the second part is that the scapula cannot be moved out from the visual from the lung fields and therefore whatever is behind the scapula might be obscured so please look at this part of uh, the lung which is under the scapula more properly that is about the ap view or uh, the third view is lateral view so before we had ct scans you know when we were students we were doing lateral views all the time because as i said pa view is one dimensional so what looks like mid zone could be either middle lobe or could be upper lobe or could be lower lobe so when we take a lateral view we come to know whether it's in the upper lobe or the middle lobe or the lower lobe at the same time sometimes you don't know whether it's a lung abscess or it's a loculated hydropneumothorax so if you do a lateral view the lateral view will tell you whether it belongs to the lung because a lung opacity will always respect the lung margins the lung boundaries the lung fissures whereas pleura will not respect anything so from the lateral view you come to know whether it's a lung abscess or it's a hydropneumothorax or uh, so basically if you want to differentiate whether what part of the lung or whether it's in pleura or something or something which is behind the heart or uh, you can see it better in the lateral view so this is what the lateral view is about and sometimes we have the lateral decubitus view which is again very important so before we had ultrasound or ct scans if we suspected pleural effusion which was very small then we would do lateral decubitus x ray in which the patient lies down on the side where the pleural effusion is suspected and the fluid will migrate over there and you will get get basically homogeneous opacity a straight line that would tell you that this is the pleural effusion as against this if the patient is in the icu and you are suspecting pneumothorax and if the patient can't sit up you can't send him for a ct scan ultrasound is not available the deep sulcus sign is not being seen in that case you can actually make the patient go if i'm suspecting right pneumothorax and make the patient go left lateral decubitus and what will happen is that by gravity the lung will move towards the hilum and the air will go up and you can then make out the pneumothorax so this is the advantage of lateral decubitus for pleural effusion the abnormal side goes down and for pneumothorax the abnormal side goes up and the last one is the apical lordotic view so when you do a chest x ray and you think that maybe if it's a lung has something but i don't know if it's there then you can do apical lordotic view because whatever is in the apex of the lung will be better seen so these are the important views that we can actually use for our patient and without doing a ct scan we know what we are dealing with okay thank you so much so um we will just have a few more questions if you don't mind i guess we've been speaking for a number of minutes but um if you could take some more time so um is are there any ways we could differentiate the etiology in terms of 
um, if it's an infection from an x-ray. I know, for example, during COVID, we saw a kind of picture of um, a certain type of um, opacity pattern um, compared to when you're dealing with bacterial pneumonia. So would you just maybe speak to that viral versus fungal versus bacterial um, pneumonias or causes of respiratory tract infection? Any differences? So this is an excellent question. I'm so happy you asked me this question. So basically the thing is that we need to understand that viral pneumonias and atypical pneumonias, by atypical pneumonias, I mean chlamydia, legionella, mycoplasma. So viral and atypical pneumonias affect the interstitium of the lung. So if you have viral or atypical pneumonias, because it's affecting the interstitium of the lung, the involvement will be less than one centimeter in size. So you will either see reticulations, the linear markings, or you will see nodules which are less than one centimeter. So if you see appearance like this, then you know it's either viral or atypical infection. As against that, bacteria and fungi, these affect the alveoli of the lungs and if the opacity more, will be more than one centimeter in size. So if, and also TB. So the thing is that TB can affect the interstitium in the form of miliary TB, in which case it will be less than one centimeter. But when TB, the normal TB, when it's affecting the lung, parenchyma, so TB, bacteria and fungi, the opacity will be more than one centimeter and uh, opacity will be less than one centimeter in viruses and in atypical infections. Okay, thank you. So um, are there any times when x-rays are not enough? So when do we, um, I know now we've had a lot of, um, I mean, we have CT scans um, available in most countries. So when do you think we must do probably a CT scan um, instead of just doing a chest x-ray? And then if you could just add on this question, are there any indication, I mean, are there any guidelines to tell us how frequently we could do a chest x-ray? So the first part, when is chest x-ray not enough? And then um, second one is how frequently can we do a chest x-ray because of risk of radiation? Right. So basically the thing is that if the history is acute and you know what you're really dealing with, for example, the history is really matching with a bacterial pneumonia and the x-ray is showing a consolidation, then you don't really need to do a CT scan of the patient. You can treat the patient. You can repeat x-ray, the first x-ray after three days, etc. So if the patient is responding well, if the history is acute, you don't need to do a CT scan. Also, if the patient has, say, peripheral eosinophilia and the X-ray is compatible with eosinophilic lung disease, then you can just, and if it turns out to be tropical fibrous eosinophilia, then you just want to start the patient on the appropriate treatment. You don't really need to do a CT scan. However, if you don't know what, you, if you think it's bad swing appearance, it looks like pulmonary edema, the history is fitting in, you don't need to do a CT scan. However, if you're suspecting malignancy, we need to do a CT scan because CT scan will tell you about hilar lymph nodes and it will also tell you if there are some additional rib erosions, etc., which you may have missed. If you're suspecting interstitial lung disease, then HRCD chest is absolutely necessary. Or if you think that you're dealing with something and the patient is not responding well to your treatment, then doing a CT scan is very, very important. And, uh, you know, we, yeah, and about uh, doing x rays. So basically, a thousand chest X-rays equal to uh, the exposure related to one CT scan. So please don't worry doing X-rays as many as you require. It is absolutely fine. And the radiation is not as bad as people make it out to be. So please do chest X-rays as many. There's no problem. Okay, thank you. So um, I know in Africa, we have a lot of um, etiological agents for respiratory tract infections. Um, commonly, we have you know the bacterial agents, strep streptococcus, pneumonia, sometimes on mycoplasma, especially in the middle-aged population. And um, tuberculosis is also common. So can you just throw some light on some of the common etiological agents of respiratory tract infections um, from your own experience? And um, you know, just what do you think should be our pathway to treatment in terms of drug use? OK, again, a wonderful question. So we should know that uh, strep pneumonia, streptococcus pneumonia is the most common uh, respiratory pathogen who causes chest infections, whether it's a pneumonia or it's simple uh, URTI or LRTI. Usually what happens is that by the time the patient goes to a physician, to a specialist or to a hospital, they end up receiving some antibiotic. Either they self-treat themselves or the local doctor will give them. And as a result of that, often strep pneumonia is not isolated. But even today, it remains the most common cause of any respiratory tract infection. So please, whatever medicines you want to give the patient, strep pneumonia has to be covered. If we talk about pneumonias, then I was involved in an etiological study of community acquired pneumonia in 
Mumbai. And basically what was, and over here, we actually checked up, you know, for strep pneumonia. In addition, we did sputum pneumococcal antigen. We did urine pneumococcal antigen. We did blood cultures. It was really interesting that sputum culture never really showed strep pneumonia. But the pneumococcal antigen and the urine and the blood showed it. So I just want to say that those studies don't really still show many. Uh, strep pneumonia is very, very important. Atypical pneumonia, the second most common cause of pneumonia, is at least that's what we found in our study. Mycoplasma, chlamydia, and Legionella together are the second most common cause of pneumonia when put together. And therefore, whenever you're treating a patient of pneumonia, you must have an atypical cover for your patient if it's a pneumonia. Hemophilus, uh, the third most common uh, in, uh, organism is Hemophilus and Moraxilla. So these are most common. Uh, if the patient is in the hospital, then staph Staphylococcus becomes very, very important. And if the patient has bronchiectasis or the patient has COPD or something like that, then also gram negative organisms like Pseudomonas could be possible. Okay. And if so, the patient um, is just diabetic, just... sorry, if it's a diabetic, no, no, or an I'm with you. I'm with you. please go ahead. Please go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry for breaking. Yeah, I'm sorry. So if the patient is a diabetic or if the patient is an alcoholic, then Klebsiella is something that we want to also keep it in our mind. In addition to TB for everybody, TB can always be the cause. Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, so how about viral causes? Any any, any, any light on that? I know, for example, um, because of COVID, there's been a lot of pushback to look at some of the viral causes, like um, influenza. Um, any experience with that? Yeah, yeah, actually, I was only answering about the bacteria. I'm sorry if I was... Uh, so viruses are extremely, extremely common. In fact, the thing is that uh, I don't know, this is what at least we are seeing in India. So basically the thing is that, you know, because of COVID, we all have been masked. We are wearing a mask everywhere. And the thing is that normally people don't take uh, influenza vaccine. Usually, at least in India, people don't routinely take it. So basically the thing is that because we have been masked and because we have protection from COVID because of COVID vaccine and because we're not taking the viral shot, what is happening is that there's really a surge of viral infections in India. And the thing is, that is because we have forgotten our immunity to influenza, para-influenza, adenovirus, and the respiratory syncytial virus. And therefore, currently, anybody who's coughing, anybody has any infection, it is a viral infection unless proven otherwise. Because of, you know, being masked, taking, wearing a mask for two years, and actually losing our immunity to the common viruses. So viruses are extremely common uh, organisms. And basically, if the patient has high-grade fever with chills, running nose, throat infections, dry cough, malaise, body pain, fatigue, always, always think of a viral infection. And we, in fact, have a respiratory biofire. We just put a swab and we find out what virus we are dealing with. And um, actually, you know, if it is a viral infection, then treating the patient with antivirals also really helps. It cuts down the duration of illness significantly, especially for us doctors, where, however well or unwell we have to go to work. So viruses are extremely yeah. common. Okay. Or funguses, okay. I would Thank like to so say, much. in immunocompromised patients. Funguses, if at all, in immunocompromised patients, not in immunocompetent patients. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So um, so what's been your experience as we try to round up this question and answer session? Um, beta lactams um, as a class to treat um, respiratory tract infections of bacterial origin because... As primary care physicians, there's always this debate. What class do we go for? Do you think that the beta-lactams, for example, your amoxicillin, clavonalic acid, still has a role to play um, in management of respiratory tract infections? Uh, you know, I, I completely agree with you because the thing is that, you know, as I said, the most common organisms are strep pneumonia, hemophilus, and Neisseria. And all three of these are covered actually by the combination of uh, amoxicillin clavulonic acid. Because the thing is that amoxicillin alone will not cover hemophilus and Neisseria, but the clavulonic acid, the beta-lactam part. So basically the thing is that any patient with a commonly acquired infection, you know, RLRTI, URTI, my treatment of choice would be amoxicillin clavulonic acid upfront. Even if the patient has COPD, then also they have strep pneumonia, Borexilla and Neisseria, and therefore, or, uh, you know, uh, uh, hemophilus. So uh, basically I would definitely treat the patient with a combination of amoxicillin clavulonic acid as my first antibiotic of choice because it's going to take care of the organisms which are commonly seen. If the patient is staph aureus also, then it also takes care of. 
I would say that if the patient has a pneumonia or, you know, actual consolidation, then also I would say amoxicillin, clavulonic acid, definitely. And along with that, I would recommend an atypical cover. So I would say that either give azithromycin or doxycycline with it. But I would definitely say that amoxicillin, clavulonic acid has to be given. I mean, that would be my first line treatment. Okay, thank you. So, I, I mean, I think we need to bring that out, as you mentioned, amoxicillin, clavulonic acid, and then we could add on a macrolide um, if we are suspecting some atypical agent. And I'm, I'm saying this because, for example, in Nigeria, what we've seen is sometimes people are using more of quinolones and it's giving us a lot of problems because we know that the quinolones would be a second line for tuberculosis. So, some, so we are also pushing the guideline, as you mentioned, to use amoxicillin, clavonalic acid as against um, plus or minus a macrolide like azithromycin, as you mentioned, as against going to print a load. Would you think that that's, um, yeah, I mean, that would be a fair representation? You know, this is such an important point that you've made, and I really respect you for you having said this. You know, we as physicians need to understand that TB is a menace. TB is still number one killer in the entire world. You know, and the thing is that quinolones are a huge armamentarium, you know, in a huge weapon uh, armamentarium against TB. And we have to save it. We have to keep it. We cannot be using quinolones for anything else but TB. So whether it is urinary tract infection, upper SP tract infection, if it's typhoid, if it's a wound infection, whatever it may be, please let's take a pledge. We will never prescribe quinolone to this patient. Because in addition to quinolone, there are so many other medicines to give for all these infections. But for TB, for drug-resistant TB, we only have quinolones. So, I mean, it would be irresponsible. I would use the word irresponsible, which I know is a harsh word. But I want to really make it a point that please do not use quinolones to treat pneumonias, to treat respiratory tract infections, to treat uh, urinary tract infections. Quinolones have to be kept only as a TB drug. So if there's upper SP tract infection, lower SP tract infection, please use amoxicillin, clavulonic acid. And if the patient has a pneumonia, actual patch on the x-ray, in addition to amoxicillin, clavulonic acid, you can use a macrolide. You can also use a tetracycline, but never a quinolone. And if the guidelines are actually saying it, please change your guidelines right away because I will call them irresponsible guidelines. Yeah. Okay. So thank you. Thank you so much. So last question, so I give you the time to rest. And um, before we take questions from the audience, how can we prevent respiratory tract infections? Any advice, any guide? I know you mentioned the vaccines. So if you could speak to that and then any other measures we could use. Thank you so much. Yeah. So I would say that viral vaccines are mandatory. We as physicians must take them and we must encourage every person to take it, whether it's a child, a pregnant woman or an older person. So I would basically say that uh, viral vaccines are very, very important. I would recommend for everybody. On pneumonia vaccines, if the patients have some kind of, uh, if they are immunocompromised or they have any kind of a long-term disease or respiratory insufficiency, I would recommend pneumonia vaccines or anybody who's more than 65 years of age. So we would say that please give the uh, polyvalent 13, the Prevenar 13 first and uh, eight weeks uh, later, if the patient has respiratory problems or one year later, you can give the conjugated pneumo 23. That is what I would recommend. Uh, and uh, I would basically say that uh, please, uh, you make sure that if you're going to a place which is infected, you're wearing a mask, you don't want to be in very polluted and you don't want to be in very crowded places. You please make sure you don't smoke, don't have alcohol, have good healthy food, have lots of water and sleep at least for eight hours every night because good sleep also improves your immunity. So this is what I would really recommend. And of course, if the patients have COPD and other conditions, then we have the other vaccines also that have been recommended. But for us, I mean, please take a flu shot. Uh, avoid smoking completely, say a no to any kind of tobacco, chewing tobacco, smoking tobacco, no alcohol, eat good healthy food, exercise, lots of water and sleep well. And please wear a mask when you're going to infected places. Thank you so much, Dr. Amita. It's been, it's been a wonderful session. So um, really so much. So I'm going to hand over to Dr. Raul to um, take any more questions for the audience. From the thank audience you so, so that much. we could really interact. Thank this you so much. Discussion. Wonderful. Brilliant. So interesting. Thank you so much. Hi, Dr. Rahul. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks to you, uh, ma'am, for, for such a wonderful session. It is fully loaded with yeah. X-ray images, absolutely pictorial presentation. And uh, uh, thanks for giving your consent, right, for the circulation of 
your slides it is going to be very useful for all the audience i hope you can understand this is very uh, informative and maybe difficult to you know uh, absorb it in in this one hour's time so they will go through right and most of their colleagues will also get benefited from these slides and uh, thanks to dr sudipo for for raising you know a uh, very thoughtfully uh, crafted questions right today i am sure you are the voice of hundreds of audience by asking this very compelling questions to the ma'am fantastic so please allow me to take some questions from the audience uh so i am just going through the question most of them they are already covered during uh, during your discussion or during ma'am's presentation so uh is it possible to detect pneumonia in in the early stage by using x ray uh, should i answer will dr sudipo will answer uh, it, it is you could you could go ahead first dr anita you could go ahead okay first. yes so chest x ray would be very very useful for early diagnosis of a pneumonia but just to basically say that chest x ray still takes up to 3 days to pick up a pneumonia So, if you are clinically suspecting a pneumonia, and so please, chest X-ray is the first investigation to do. However, if the chest X-ray comes does not show anything, you know, then please go ahead and do a CT scan of the chest because your treatment will change. If there is a pneumonia actual opacity, then you'll also give an atypical cover with a macrolide or a tetracycline in addition to giving your amoxicillin clavulanic acid. So, suspect if suspecting a pneumonia, doing a chest X-ray is the first investigation. However, strong suspicion, chest X-ray comes normal. go ahead and do a ct scan no problem also if it's a left low lobe pneumonia often it would be behind the heart and the chest x ray may miss it so all the signs are of the left low lobe pneumonia x ray doesn't show it please go ahead do a ct scan it will better rationalize your treatment yeah yeah so i think um yeah so i so i agree with um dr mitter um yeah so the x ray has its role but um sometimes too we may also need to do some other investigations maybe a sputum test too um uh, an mcs but as she mentioned a lot of patients may have been on antibiotics already so that could affect the result so the x-ray is still you know very very important in terms of management yes right okay let's move on to next uh, which is related to tuberculosis so uh, aside from the cxr uh, are there any imaging techniques uh, doctors you would like to recommend for the diagnosis of tuberculosis as well as leprosy Okay. Uh, should I answer? Yes, please. Okay, fine. Yeah. So basically, the thing is that uh, of course, uh, X-ray has to be done in a patient of tuberculosis, and uh, because you know it's not only important for diagnosis, it's also important for follow-up of treatment. So chest X-ray is mandatory, but sometimes again we may miss something on the chest X-ray. So for example, lymph nodes, the mediastinal lymph nodes are not very well seen on a chest X-ray. So in that case, we're suspecting that a lymph node is probably prominent. or you are suspecting tb in the chest x ray comes normal then doing a ct scan of the chest is absolutely mandatory it would be with or without contrast depending on what you are looking out for so if it's usually parenchyma alone then you don't really need a contrast however if it is anything in the mediastinum then the contrast might be required if there is pleural involvement also then the contrast would be required so the ct scan would definitely become important in such cases and also if there is some kind of extra pulmonary tb you know in that case uh, like if there's spine tb then you can do mri of the spine if there's abdominal tb ct scan of the abdomen could be done so uh, that is about it so also i want to uh, add a very important thing that x ray or ct scan can never be used to confirm tb it will be suggestive of tb but you have to confirm it with a sputum test or any appropriate investigation based on what type of tb it is But please never ever treat TB empirically. You need to confirm the diagnosis. And leprosy. Yeah, think... yeah. yeah, go ahead. No, go sorry. ahead. Go ahead, Doctor Amitra. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, so that was about TB. And now for TB, we have so many molecular tests. We have urogene expert, and we've got so many other molecular tests in addition to sputum. So we can never because the thing is, it's not about confirming TB. It's also confirming drug resistance up front because we have so much of MDR TB. in people who have never received akt so for primary mdr tb you know it's mandatory to confirm rifampicin resistance before we start akt so let's please never diagnose uh, tb on uh, imaging that is one thing and coming to the leprosy part i mean leprosy would be more of a skin condition and uh, role of a skin specialist 
would be extremely important over here. Right. Yeah, I think what I wanted to add to what um, Dr. Amita mentioned is, I don't know, from my experience now, we're seeing um, some mimics of tuberculosis, um, for example, sarcoidosis. I don't know, um, and sometimes they are reported as, you know, being um, some tuberculosis, but I think we must also have it at the back of our mind that if you've done your gene expert, as she mentioned, you've done your other probe tests, you've done your CT scan, you've done your chest X-ray, and it's neither here nor there, Let's also try to investigate for sarcoidosis, maybe do a serum angiotensin converting enzyme. So I've seen a couple of cases where we missed eventually with our respiratory physicians. We were able to make a diagnosis that, oh, it wasn't TB, but it was his close cousin, which was um, sarcoidosis. So um, just to mention yeah, that. Very important point by Dr. Sadipu for the message. I, I mean, I completely agree with him because TB and sarcoid are like brothers. They can really mimic each other. But a very important message to everybody in Africa Please never treat a chest X-ray empirically. Never treat a CT scan empirically. Whatever it may look like, however confident your radiologist is, please do necessary investigation, confirm diagnosis, only then treat. Right. So, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I would like to move to the next question, which is obviously related to uh, pneumonia. I think pneumonia is the most commonly popped up word uh, which is closely linked to X-rays. So uh, our audience would like to know uh, how to differentiate between pneumonia and pulmonary edema on chest X-ray. Okay, wonderful question. Very, very interesting. So pulmonary edema is usually bilateral and pneumonia is usually unilateral unless the patient is immunocompromised. So first of all, in pulmonary edema, you see bilateral opacities, whereas in X-ray, you see unilateral opacity. Pulmonary edema usually is parahylar. So you see around the heart opacity, both the mid zones, lower zones. And often with pulmonary edema, we see plural effusion, uh, we see plural effusions, which we don't, bilateral plural effusions, which we normally don't see in pneumonia. And in pneumonia, it'll be involving basically a particular area of the lobe of the lung. And with that, there would be usually air bronchogram, which we normally don't see in pulmonary edema. So this is how I'm, in pulmonary edema, usually patients have a cardiomegaly which will not be seen in pneumonia. So these are the features, X-ray features, which tell you about pneumonia or pulmonary edema. And of course, the clinical features, a patient of pulmonary edema will have edema feet, they'll have pink frothy sputum, they'll have raised JVP, they'll have bipasal spine crepitations, they'll have S3 gallop on auscultation, as against a pneumonia patient who's going to have either tubular bronchial breathing in the area of pneumonia or may have crepitations on that particular area. Yes, I think just to add to what Dr. Amita said, I, I also want to um, advise our physicians that when we are up, um, asking for some of these investigations, we need to give a proper history. I think Dr. Amita mentioned it during her presentation. It's not just good enough to just see an x-ray. We need to also guide our radiologists and co based on the history. And as she has mentioned also, you know, some of the history points and then some of the physical examination findings have to be tied in to our investigations that we now see. So that will guide us. So I think it's a combination as she rightly uh, mentioned. Yes. Right, so uh, we have very few questions left uh, now. Uh, in what condition does one use the uh, lordotic view of X-ray? Okay, excellent question. I'm happy I could repeat this point. So the thing is that sometimes it could be involving the apical region some opacity could be involving the apical region of the lungs. And in the upper lobes of the lung, we have the clavicles coming, we have the ribs, the upper ribs are very crowded next to each other. And then we have other soft tissue. And as a result of that, the upper lobes of the lungs are not very well seen in a PA view. So if we think that there is some abnormality in the apical region, then we can do apical lordotic view, which will show you something which was missed on a PA view. So this is a time when we would like to do apical lordotic view. Right. Perfect. Dr. Sudhibu, would you like to add? No, just, I think, I mean, I think that's fine. I, I was, I myself learned a lot about um, the Lodotic view. So I think it's something that going forward, especially where we don't have CT scans, it's a very good view that we could order for and, you know, get some added information. So thank you so much, Dr. Amita, for that. Yeah. Thank you. Pleasure. Yeah. Now I'll take up uh, maybe last two questions. Uh, what does consolidations signifies on a chest X-ray? 
Yeah, so actually the thing is that the consolidation, so pneumonia is actually a medical term and the pathological term is consolidation in which the parenchyma of the lung and the alveoli are filled with, in, with exudate. So basically the thing is that consolidation is actually a pathological term like that you see on histopathology and consolidate uh, and the thing is that uh, also uh, clinically what we see uh, the symptoms etc makes it a pneumonia and so consolidation is more of radiological and more of histopathological term and this appearance when put together with symptoms in a patient with clinical findings is called a pneumonia right so uh, let's move to the last towards last question that uh, particularly in you know in a healthcare setup uh, in developing countries how to use x-rays in a best possible way but wisely considering uh, its uses as well as the safety concerns okay so i want to again repeat that you know x-rays are no longer uh, known to be having too many radiations etc so please forget about the radiation part uh, i kind of feel x-ray is an easily available test which is not very expensive so the thing is that if the patient's history is like three to four days the patient is not very unwell if the patient is fine then you don't necessarily need to do a chest x-ray so you can just treat empirically with a simple antibiotic like as we spoke amoxicillin clavulonic acid however if the patient doesn't get better where you think that you're dealing with a consolidation or pneumonia or you're treating dealing with tb or malignancy or upfront the patient comes extremely unwell then you definitely want to do a chest x-ray in a breathless patient in a patient who is coughing severely, in a patient who has got very high grade fever with chills, or if the patient has come with hypoxia, you want to do an x-ray because over here x-ray will tell you what you're dealing with and upfront you will start correct treatment so that uh, we, a precious time is not lost and patient's condition doesn't worsen. So I would say that in today's day and world, we should absolutely have no uh, hesitation in doing a chest x-ray required. Chest x-ray is not CT scan of the chest. So if your patient is not looking good, please do a chest x-ray. He's breathless, do a chest x-ray. There's thoracic chest pain, do a chest x-ray. He's hypoxic, he's breathless, do a chest x-ray. You started treatment, he's not got better, please do a chest x-ray. And don't worry about the radiation part at all. Yeah, I think um, I think Dr. Abita has really captured it. And um, another probably another word for us as physicians is um, we should also try to examine our patients. Um, sometimes you could get some um, clinical futures that will point towards either a consolidation or whether the person or the person has um, a pleural effusion. I know one of the challenges that happened, I don't know whether that's the same case maybe in India, was that with COVID, um, doctors tried to step back from examining patients um, because everybody was afraid of getting infected. So the first thing is go and do the investigation. But I think we could still try to um, percuss the chest. We could still try to um, auscultate, you know, so that that way we have actually have some clinical input and see whether definitely this patient needs a chest x-ray. As Dr. Amita has mentioned, let's not forget that sometimes patients could even present with complications. For example, somebody could have a tuberculosis or a pneumonia with a pleural effusion, and that would only be, I mean, your examination, if you just give your antibiotics without examining and you defer your x-ray, you may be missing out on some you know, important clinical information. And that may be the reason why the patient is not getting better, especially, for example, those that are breathless. So, um, I think we just need to combine everything. But as she has mentioned, chest x-ray is a low-hanging fruit. I think all of us as primary care physicians should, you know, um, probably advocate for it to be included in our health insurance schemes in our various countries. It's not a CT scan that is so expensive. So I think even at a district hospital, we should be able to do a chest x-ray. But let's always remember to also examine our patients and have a clinical input. Yes. Yeah, I completely agree with you, Dr. Sudipo. Very well said. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you once again, sir and ma'am, for for this. This is fully loaded with clinical insights, this session. And uh, I, I have personally enjoyed it. Uh, and uh, thanks to everyone who who is, uh, you know, who has participated in this session. And thanks for your continuous interest in our webinars. So uh, as we already have mentioned that we will share uh, this entire slide deck as well as recorded video with you uh, by emails. So not just with you, but those who have registered for this program. And uh, I would like to pass on our sincere thanks to all professional bodies. They are 
partnering with us for CME uh, accreditation. So uh, we are looking forward for uh, organizing uh, many more such uh, conversations. So please stay tuned. We will keep you updated about the future programs. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank it's you. been a pleasure completely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rao. Dr. Anita, thank you. And to thank all you the audience, thank you. Thank you, everybody.